Good day everyone, beautiful people. How are we all doing on this? Well, it's actually quite a beautiful Monday morning here in Melbourne. I hope you're all very well. If you are new around here, please like and subscribe to the channel. We're so close to 300, it's unbelievable. Only need 16 subs, so if you can smash that like button, give it a share on your socials, that would be really splendid. I'd really appreciate it. Thank you so much for your love and support. So on Pom's Ponderings today, probably the most watched show is after a win or a loss. And yeah, we had a tough loss against uh, the Eagles yesterday. It's taken me 24 hours to recover. There's quite a lot to get through today. And um, let's get straight into it. So I mean, if we look at it like pro logically, it was a really good start from the boys. We had a 212 pressure rating, so the AFL does its own pressure rating and its scales, and 212 is way above the AFL average of 185. And that kind of really encompassed what we were about the first quarter. We hit the contest hard, we didn't give them time. In the preview I talked about, you've got to not allow them time on the ball, time to do what they do, to execute their game plan. You've got to come out firing, and we really did. I thought we really looked to make them second and third efforts count. There was obviously a disparity in the rook against Nick Nat. He's absolutely flying at the moment. And when he hits his straps, for me, he is one of the best ruckmen in the competition. And we, we, we negated that threat by being really tough around the ball, really looking to hit the break hard, get the ball inside 50 and lock it in, and really make West Coast soak up. And then from then on in, Things started to happen. The mistakes started to come. Umpiring, let's talk about that just really briefly because I don't want to get caught up in that. To me, I find that's the biggest weakness of any side when you start talking about the variables. But yeah, the, the umpiring was shit. Let, let's be honest, it was a disgrace. How number 22 is legally allowed to have an opinion is beyond me because if that's their interpretation of some of the most rudimentary AFL rules... It's beyond me. Like, if anyone deserves their voice being removed, that is it. <sighs> Fuck me, that was bad. But aside from that, it just started, the wheels fell off. There's Terry covered it in Blue Abroad's review. Of, there's that, like, uh-oh moment. Like, I call it the uh-oh moment in a relationship. You know when something happens with your partner, and it's probably happened to everyone. Everyone can relate to this. And just... There's that uh oh moment where you see the beginning and the end of the relationship where you know this relationship probably isn't for me and it's probably going to go tits up soon. There's the uh oh moment. And you, you saw it with Carlton and you saw the pressure. Now, let's talk about the game. For me, when I look at this team, and we've got to bear in mind this is one of the oldest teams that was fielded this weekend. We've still got a couple of games to go, but this round, this is one of the oldest teams. You see the losing culture in the side, you really do. And I think the way, the best analogy that I'd use to describe Carlton Football Club at the moment when they play is they remind me of the year 10. You know that kid that grew the moustache before everyone else and he thought he was 10 Bears Johnson? And he used to bully everyone. And then eventually one day he picked on lunchtime on the kid who had a, who had a brother in year 11. And the year 11 brother came and sorted him out and he turned to complete meadow Lee butter. It's what we are, we're the schoolboy bully. When teams aren't playing well, we look up and about, we look hard at it. We look good, man. And I'm nothing's changed. The way I approach these videos is I truly vermilently believe we are a team that can challenge for top eight if you play our best 22. But they fall to butter when a team comes back. And let's look at how West Coast alleviated the pressure. They did it tremendously two weeks ago against Geelong. And there's something we can learn from it. Their runoff half back, we had a really high forward press. We talked about their ability to kick it out of defensive 50 in the preview. And we talked about their ability to find chains and alleviate pressure with smart handballs and smart short kicks and work their way up the ground. There was runoff half back for them. Duggan was phenomenal when they were under pressure. He didn't touch it when they were on top. But when they were under pressure, he was on he was phenomenal. Six marks in the first quarter. He had like 14 touches by half time. He was everywhere. And it was that run, that energy off halfback. And then I look at Carlton and we've got SPS. And I don't know what has happened to SPS because I froth him. He's like one of my favourite players for Carlton. But down at halfback, the guy just doesn't put anything up on when we're under pressure. He just looks to kick continually into traffic. I don't get it. 
And I know them umpiring decisions were stiff, but my argument is they shouldn't be in that position. Let's go through some of them decisions. SPS shouldn't stand still at halfback at all in front of the goal square. Shouldn't stand still at all. It's You know traffic is coming from all sides. SPS shouldn't be in the position at halfback anyway that he gets a handball when there's two blokes around him. Okay, it was a stiff decision. It probably wasn't holding the ball. The interpretation is flawed. However, shouldn't be in that position. That ball should have gone down the wing. Should have gone down the flank. You don't see GW. You don't see West Coast do that. String of handballs when there's 75 people in the forward 50. They look to relieve pressure the traditional way and reset and re go again if they can't find that break out. And then you've got like Cripps and the Natanui. It didn't get paid, but he should take that mark all day long. Cripps should take that mark. You look at him and his eyes go off the ball. And Cripp is going to come into a little bit of pressure in this review, I'll warn anyone. Because to me, he is our leader and he has to be judged not on what he's done before, but what he does last game. You can't give players respect because of what they've done in the past. It's madness, that. It's just a mad approach. It blags my head that we do it. SPS and Setterfield were brilliant in the first half. Brilliant. Laying tackles, finding pressure really looking to move the ball well. And then in the second half, when the pressure goes on, they turn into butter. And I, I can't answer it, because if we look at the team stats, we look at the team stats, you'd go over it, we had less turnovers, less clangers. You, you look at it and you think, this game is anyone's, from a statistical standpoint. And I know a lot of you will focus on the umpires, but I'm telling you, that isn't it. This mirage of rubbish I've heard of, it affects momentum. The facts are, the free kicks that were there, we shouldn't have been in that position. So, regardless, you can't blame an umpire. You can't blame a variable. Because we could have still won that game. This week, I watch every game of football because I love it. And I also find it's a good lesson to see what we're lacking. All the sides. Port had some horrendous decisions go Richmond's way. They still won. They still find momentum. They still find a way to control the most precious side of the comp. And then hit them hard back. It, it can be done. There was times Setfield kicked the first, but we kicked the first and the fourth, and the pressure just went after that. It just filtered away. We allowed Rich West Coast to do whatever they wanted. But I think the two key areas for me that we look at and black my head is one is centre clearances, is, is clearances in general. It's clearances in general. They absolutely nailed us in that position, and we knew they were going to. And for me, there was. Like, Ed Kerno spent most of his time in Elliot Yo. Like, what's going on there? Why tag Elliot? Like, Tim Kelly battered us for four quarters. He was doing whatever he wanted whenever he wanted. Murph was on Shuey, and Shuey just found influence after influence. Murph was on Sheed, and Sheed was just going wherever he wanted, whenever he wanted. Like, there was so much running, and the only midfielder I think who gets any praise this week for me is Walsh. Walsh looked like he was committed. But you see it, the heads go down. It's like the metaphorical tortoise in the shell, and its head goes in to its shell when the pressure's on. We do that. We didn't stand up. For me, I think it encompasses a lot of things about this football club that, to me, there was no tactical changes in the second half, and they needed to be. Pittenet had too much time in the rook. He was getting nailed. You look at Casbolt, he was going at 60%. He won 39% against Nick Natanui. Like that, he's off its head. TDK did really well. We talked about it. Playing a tandem role. I was watching it. TDK in the third and Casbolt, they interchanged. They kind of did two hit outs each. It threw Nick Nat off his rhythm. We started to win clearances. Then in the fourth, when the chips are down, Pitonet's full time. Like, come on, it's not rocket science. Sport isn't that hard, man. Do some basics right. Like, fucking hurts, man. I, like, I, I know you're probably saying, Pom, we lost to one of the top four sides, but I, I don't buy that, man. I don't. Like, for me, w we shouldn't be striving for greatness. You listen to Gold Coast, Stewie Jew, he talks about eight, and the aim from the start of the season was top eight. They were diarrhoea last year. Win games. Like, when David Teague is coming out and saying that's one of our better performances, if our better performance is a four-goal loss, we've got fucking big problems, and I think we need to stop pandering to them. Stop pandering to them, because that was a winnable game, regardless of umpiring decisions. 
if there were some winners in that game, some senior players with winning mentality, they would have said, I think Dane, my mate, summed it up really well. Top teams, they just go, oh, turn to chapter three, how to win when it's tough. And our chapter three is just a blank page where someone's probably drawing a cock and balls on it at the moment and the winning manual for some of our senior players. There's just no writing. And it hurts, man. Let's go through individual players because I, I, I'm hurting, man. And give me some love, please. But any bets? I mean, any bets? He, he, he tried. There was that that Eddie type moment where he got the ball out of a stoppage and it just missed. So one of them games, I mean, for me, he's slowing down. You can see it. He's an older player and he brings the intensity. He brings the enthusiasm. I understand why he's out. I'm not critiquing him. But there was no goals. He tried. I mean, there was the forward pressure was there from Eddie. That's something that he's added, particularly playing for a decent, cultured side like Carlton. It wasn't a great game. But you can see, like, obviously, that, that, that is one of them positions that I'm looking at and saying that we need a replacement for that because that's not going to last forever. And we need someone who's high tackling and who's going to get the goals. Casbol, I thought Casbol competed well. His goal kicking was that, that shot goal. I mean, it summed it up, didn't it? A set shot and goal on an angle and he hits his scum shield. I mean, that is the most Carlton thing I can think of ever. I thought he did really well, though, in his hit outs that he did. I thought he, he negotiated Oscar Allen really well and he, he did pretty well against Nick Nainui. I thought that, that was impressive. He... He, he didn't look to jump with him. He looked to physically restrain him. and He read the playbook, Kazi. Um, wasn't a great game from a forward point of view, but I thought his work around the ground was good. Cottrell, I enjoy his zip and intensity. He gave some players like a 20-metre head start, and he got there, and I, I enjoyed that. He looked like he gave his shit, which is, well, like you can see he's a Carlton fan. He, he wasn't willing to let that four-point slide, and full credit to you. Full credit to you, Cotters. I hope to see you again. Cripper, let's be real about Crips. Tell me a captain in the history of the AFL that takes a one-handed mark, giggles, looks to his mates and goes, look what I just did, and then shanks the kick. Like, for me, there is one of the issues, and you might say I'm being harsh, I, I genuinely don't care, it's just my belief, but you wouldn't see Koch do that, you wouldn't see Fife do that. And for me, that encompassed Carlton's mentality at times. It's, oh, we, we've done something good, but we can't finish it off. Like, sure, freaking, you know, get a pat on the back from your boys because you've taken a, a, a one-handed mark. It was exemplary. I've jumped off the couch. But you've got to make sure you finish that. There's no point making a tiramisu and then not letting me eat it. I ain't going to get excited about it. For me, yeah, he competed well. He did what Crypts did. But, again, this guy... Honestly, you wouldn't have him. There's, they're running the Tag World Championships. It's on KO next week. You wouldn't have him in your tag team, would you? Because the guy can't break a tag. I don't know what is going on with Cripper. don't know if he's playing hurt. I mean, for some reason, he's the only person in the world who's lost weight who's slowed down. And, I mean, the only moments that I enjoyed was when he started in the forward goal square. I thought our midfield seems to step up when he's not there. And then we brought him back, and it all went to tits, didn't it? I mean... Ke that that third quarter did Kelly was was Kelly just taking the piss out of me? Someone answer in the comments because that was a complete shit show. Kelly had more time. I mean, like he needs to ch like I've got an issue with Tim Kelly because he robbed some of them centre clearances when he broke away, and even Ned Kelly had the common courtesy to put a mask over his face. Tim's just there smiling assassin. Great work, Tim Kelly. Hats off to you, Ed Kerner. I don't know why he's tagged in. Yo, I really don't. For me, the danger there was either Shuey or Kelly. You've got to stop the ball getting to them. And Yo's just Crips. Like, just let Crips go head to head with him. I mean, how do you judge that game? Because who did he tag? Like, did he stop anyone? Because the entire midfield at West Coast has just had numbers that are obscene. It was, it, for me, I don't understand the worth of Ed Kerno if he's not tagging and stopping a player. It's it, he's, he's a great, great tagger. For me, one of the best in the competition. If he's not tagging their most dangerous player, what is the point of having him on the field? And who called that? Like, Yo's never going to hurt you. It's the players he gives the ball to that hurt you. And Yo, I, I would consider he's untaggable the way he plays. It, it doesn't really matter if you tag him. So you've got to stop who he's relieving it to. You've got to make him put a bit of pressure on. 
TDK, I thought he, he showed a lot of promise. And for me, I think now we're at the stage where we're going to have to do a Tim English scenario with him. Just play the guy, man. Like, the guy, his, his marking was questionable. He missed a lot of sitters. Like, we've got to give a criticise we've lost. But I thought, aside from that, he competed really hard. I thought he really played to his strengths against Nick Knight. Didn't always work out. He had a 20% win ratio in the hit-out department, which isn't great. He by no means battered to, um, Nick Knight. But he, he, I thought, for me, he, he trusted his own confidence. And that is there what a lot of Carlton players need to learn from TDK. Just back yourself in. Under pressure, he, he had the hardest job on the ground, man. Third game playing against Nick Knight. Forget about it. And he did it. Doc, I feel sorry for Doc because I, I watch Carlton in the coaching box and they must see that every team plays pressure forward that tags a halfback. Evidently, we don't understand why Doc's numbers are down the last five games because people are tagging him. It's basic AFL 2020. Why is it, Why don't we have a forward that is on someone? Give it to Gibbons, man. He tackles and his pressure acts are elite. Aside from this week, just put him on someone because Shepard and Duggan in the first, they were having a complete bubble at my expense. And I feel sorry for the guy because I don't blame Doc's numbers and I think, Doc, you can't blame him because it's obvious what's going to happen. SPS ain't going to run off half-back. Willow did in the, in, in the third and fourth. I'll give him that. And Simmel's not going to run off half-back. No one thinks about taking the ball out of defensive 50 unless it's a nothing kick coming down with snow on it down, down the wing. Like, what do you expect him to do? I feel sorry for Doc. Like, honestly, Doc is thrown under the bus by this back line at times. Like, he's just getting tagged. And the only way to stop that is having a lot of players that do the same thing and no one thinks of doing it. SPS is more than capable now with the games played and the skill set he's shown to run off halfback, relieve a bit of bloody pressure, stop kicking it into their midfield and expecting it to come back. Run it out there! Take the game on! Poor Doc, man. Fish. What? Exemplary. Like, it just is amazing to me that the guy doesn't want to play in the forward line. He then tells Teague that he's going to learn to play the forward. And... For some reason, after two months of learning the craft, he's learned to read the ball off a pack. <laughs> Zach, you are a legend. and You restore my faith in everything that is holy in this world. You really do. Four goals, well taken, proper opportunist. That guy gives his shit, Zach Fisher. Get around him. I, I appreciate he hasn't been in the side because he's been injured. He's been learning. He's been earning it. But if we see him being dropped for the rest of the season, just based on the back of this performance, because he read packs, man. He read packs. There was none of this, oh, they're going to take the mark. He actively looked for that ball to come off the pack. And I froth it. Add in as well that, add in as well he had five tackles. What a performance. Like, if he doesn't get your three votes this week, question what you're doing. Question it. Gibbo... What can I say? He didn't really get into the game. We didn't attack that side of the flank. It was obvious we were attacking the other side. There wasn't really the pressures. Like You see the half-hearted efforts of tackling. It, it was, it, I'm, I'm willing to give him a, a freebie, though, because he has been exemplary. But for me, now we've got Fish there. Let's play Gibbons in a more defensive role, looking to get that ball inside 50. Liam Jones was phenomenal the first half. I thought his spoiling was brilliant. He really looked to lock down his defender. Then in the third, he was loose. Loose, like, I've seen a lot of people talk about Plowman. You look at the heat map, you look at the GPS data, and you actually watch the game again. In the, th in the third and fourth, he was living on Darling, and he was looser than, you know, a piss-poor made leather belt. And that has to go against him at some point. Like, he is really loose. He plays back shoulder. It's really good when we're up and about, and they're aimlessly making it inside 50 but when the wheels come off Liam Jones they come off and they came off it, it, it was a, a tale of two halves and literally every player we could say that about Bam Bam thought he competed well I think this game would have really helped if it was wet and it wasn't wet enough for him but I thought he competed hard I'd like to see him just more on the ball and Cripper go forward I thought that looked really good that stint in back end of the second start of the third he really did come into it Jackie Martin, I still love you, mate. You're the calf. I can't rate you. Murph, okay, he got a lot of the ball, but what did he do with it? Let's be honest. I mean, this is... 
when I end the show, I'll give you my synopsis. But for me, yeah, there was moments of brilliance. There was moments of hilarity. We're looking to these guys, and if you watch him defensively, defensively he offers nothing. I know that's not his game, but a good friend of mine, Ryan, he, he said, watch his game again defensively. Watch it again. Just watch four quarters. Put yourself through that. Just watch his movement off the ball. He jogs. He lets players run. He lets his player run away from him, and he's pointing at other people to pick him up, which brings them off it, and then that kick goes to them. He did it about six times in the third quarter, where he's actually called someone to take him, and he's just ambled to that guy. It's, it's, it's just not good enough. He's one of our senior experienced players. Nooms, quality biceps, quality hair. Just one of them games, wasn't it? I mean, decent tackle numbers. He shows some intent. Just he's, he's one of them players that you just he, he's there. He's he's there. He, he does his job. SPS brilliant first half. Second and second half. Just don't know what's going on. Like he stood still in the goal square. Is he, is he winding me up? Like he had longer in the goal square. Right, then freaking I've spent making cups of tea this morning and it's 12 o'clock, I've had one. Like, Jesus Christ, that was shocking. It's, uh, he's not a defender and you can't tell me he is. To me, get that guy on the ball. Put him in the guts, put him in the heat, in the furnace. Let's see, live or die. Let's see what happens because it's just not there. Like, if he's not running off halfback, there is no point. There is no point. Pit and air. God, I, I still love the bloke, but last two weeks he's totally forgotten about playing to his strengths, particularly that Port game. He just didn't play to his strengths as well three weeks ago, so it probably goes about three weeks. I mean, he's serviceable, but I mean that that was just woeful. Like he played to Nick Nat's strengths and didn't play to his. I mean, I get he's inexperienced, so we've got to maybe cut him a bit of slack, but you, you're a front liner now, bro. Doesn't happen that Plowman. Uh, I mean. He was loose at times. He did some brilliant things at times. Can't be too critical on him. I mean, he was there was a, there was a passage of play where he just I, I think lost the plot at times. He was on Cameron, and he was really loose on him. But I mean, I, I can't solely blame him. He he, he looked to it. He looked to do what Plowman does. He, he just he makes mistakes at the bad time, and I'm. I, it happens every week, and we give him too much abuse. It, it wasn't a great game, but let's be honest. Says he, he's really showing he's up for the fight. Seven tackles just personifies that. Like, for me, this is why when we started Cripper in the goal square, you saw the change. He's, he's awkward for West Coast, and we never went back to that plan. He's such an awkward customer, and I think it's one of these things where if he, it's like Dusty. They talk about Dusty while he goes there. He gets his hands on the ball, he kicks the snag, he's up and about. Setfield can handle this midfield work. He did really well. He was going up against some of the best, mid, in probably the best midfield in the comp for me. West Coast, hats off to them. They're brilliant. Why is he not having more responsibility for me? I don't get it. It was a very good game from Simo. And I, I mean, from Setfield, I'm very proud of him. Uh, I, I love what he brings. Cade Simpson, I mean, I, I'll cover it at the end of this, but I, I don't get it. I don't get it. It was good in the first half. In the second half, again, another player that just turned to water when we got struggled. Walsh, for me, I thought Walsh was actually best on ground. I thought he was brilliant. He took it to them up against a tough task. These are one of the best sides in the comp. Best sides in the comp. And he, he really looked like he was a foil for them. Weeters wasn't his best game. I thought he was brilliant on Kennedy for the first two. Kennedy started to get into it and then Kind of, he was an uphill struggle with Kennedy once he gets his going. But, again, a natural leader. You see he gives a shit. He made some mistakes this week, but you can see he gives a shit. He wears his heart on his sleeve. Willow, if I was giving one vote, Willow would get it. He toweled up, Ryan. Toweled up and also looked to inject the game himself. Six tackles. A plethora of marks. Return to form here for Willow. And I'm really excited for me... I would play him across the other halfback flank now because he's willing to take the game on and he could play that Tom Stewart type halfback role for us because his intercept marking is brilliant and elite. In summary, where I am now, and I'd love to hear your guys and girls, if you've got this stage, I'm sorry I'm not my usual chirpy self, but I have to be consistent. I believe this side can win. And I'm sorry if people don't like that, but to me, that is what being a fan is. My belief of being a fan is I want my side to win and I believe in my side. And you can't tell me our best 22 on its day can't knock these turds off. They can do. But where I am now, 
as a club is I think we've got a lot of players in the Magoos now where we've got to start looking at the future. The way I see it, Simmer, Murphy, Ed and Betts aren't going to be there for our next aren't going to be there for our next flag anytime soon. Long term, we need to look at these replacements, these holes. For me, we've heard it, we talked about it last week. We need players like Zach Williams, Broad. We need to bring a winning culture in. And if we can't do that, we're going to have to win it ourselves. We're going to have to learn it. So for me now, I'd like to see some of these players come in. I'd like to see Honey come in. I'd like to see O'Brien. He got another decent write-up at the weekend. Dow particularly, I'd like to see in and, and start feeding them in. Maybe not all at once, but definitely start maybe just dropping a couple of the senior players week at a time, giving them a stint of games, like we did with Cottrell, we brought him in, and see what these guys are about, see what they're about, because to me now, the, the eight is probably out of question, and now's the time to see, now's the time to see, because really as well, don't want to talk about this, but there's a common thing in NBA, when finals are out of the question, you start to think about trade prospects, is, is us finishing bottom four, bottom five now, deliberately, in the terms of, I'm not saying tank, but bringing some younger kids in, gaining some experience, learning this new system and having winnable games coming up against Frio and Gold Coast would be throwing some of these boys in now, getting some early dubs under their belt and really going hard for it. be beneficial in the future. I personally think it is. That's my belief. I'd like to see that. I think now what we're seeing, particularly in the last six games, is that there is better players out there than Simmer and they are probably readily available. And... For me, I would, I'd start to look at that. I, I think TDK needs to take the rook duties next couple of weeks. I think they'd be really good contests for them because Darcy and Mr. Wits do struggle against athletics. So I think maybe bring him in, we'll keep him in and let Pitternet maybe reserve hit. For me, Casper does a marvellous job as reserve hit. So I think maybe it's time for a spell. If you're asking me what my changes are next week, for me, I'm dropping Murphy, I'm dropping Pitternet and I'm bringing in Josh Honey and I'm bringing in the legend that is dun 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 Paddy Dow I'd bring both of them in and I'd give it a whirl with them I'd give it a whirl I think TDK and Casbolt can cover the rook duties and both rest forward so it doesn't ruin our structure too much and Josh Honey it'd be very exciting to see he's got some good raps let me know in the comments how you guys feel I, I, I'm caught man I'm caught because I, I expect better and I see better let me know what you guys feel. As always, it's always muchly appreciated. Don't see you through the week. I'll see you through the window. Pom out.